People here uh, write code every now and again, at least. And um, how many people don't? And um, how many people don't do the audience participation stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so, my name is Jim Sewell, and I am a computer scientist. I bear a heavy burden of guilt. Shared guilt, to be fair. Uh, so why are computers so shit, and what's the good about them? So after many, many years in academia, I know two things about computers, I think you know all two. Um, I also know that if some of you could turn off the big bright thing, then that would be very handy. The big bright thing means suck. Yeah. 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 What's yeah. What's you know. What's the big block? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you just hold up your t-shirts or something. I'd rather put it. And it's just an enormous in which you came with me enough to block the sun. You would think. So the first thing, there's an awful lot of them about. Terribly many of them. And the second thing is that they go wrong. A lot. Really, a lot. A lot. A lot. And they go wrong in lots of different kinds of ways. So sometimes they go wrong in spectacular ways. <laughs> and you get fireworks. So this, if you could see it, would be the Ariane Folk 501 fireworks. That's about half a billion dollars worth of sparkle. Um, I don't see that every day, fortunately. And why? Why? Because they were using the one component of the guidance software was for Ariane 4. And Ariane 4 didn't go sideways during the launch, quite as much as Ariane 5 did. And therefore, one of the uh, sideways values in the guidance software overflowed. <laughs> and therefore, it was all going wrong, so it blew itself up. So it's not to land on its head. So, so that's sort of like a spectacular. Wrong. And sometimes we get things going wrong in more insidious ways. So as many of you will have seen the, the heartbleed bug recently, so it's allegedly responsible for I think three and a half million medical records being nicked. The books go. Uh, one go-to in the wrong scope in the code. Uh, so that's one insidious way. And then of course there are millions of other um, Vulnerability is exploited by our friends for our protection and by other people for our lack of protection uh, continuously. But these, these kinds of wrongness, I think, are as nothing compared to the, the real problem. And the real problem is the millions upon end of wasted human hours spent battling with these things. <laughs> so it, it's hard to assess that, but what I did, you won't be able to see any of these slides. Sorry. People in the front two rows might want to go to the back so you can see. Um, yeah. So all I did was Google uh, Android problem and Windows problem, and each of those gets something like 300 million hits. So that, that's indicative of quite a lot of badness. <laughs> really a tremendous number of wasted issues. So this, is, this reminds me of something, and it should remind you of something too, but I invite you to think back to the 19th century. And what were you doing in the 19th century? You know, cool kids, you were building cool things with hot new technology. This, uh, bridges. And we would make artful bridges with millions of towers and all that kind of thing. And it was often they would fall down. And we would make magical steam engines. We have beautiful outline of steam engines. <laughs> and every so often, they would explode. Yeah. The order of steam engine with bits of steel bent all around. And that doesn't happen very often anymore for civil and mechanical engineering. Right? Mostly, 100 years later, uh, we can build stuff reasonably competently. That, mean? that means we know enough thermodynamics and material science and quality control management and other such things to predict whether our systems will work roughly as intended before we build them. Okay, so for computing this is easy because we can predict with 100% confidence that they will not work as intended and my work is done and we can go and have coffee. But it's not a very satisfactory state of affairs. So why is it so hard? And here we are, you know, 60 or 70 years after the first computers were built down the road. 
So there are several reasons. Well, there are many, many, many reasons, but I'm just going to mention a couple of them. One is that there's just too much code. <laughs> so here, there's an invisible picture of the amount of code in various operating systems of your choice and in your car. But if you get a bit more familiarity with computers, you might think that's unrealistic. And maybe we would expect that this is a castle elegantly constructed out of wooden blocks. It's a bit more baroque, but it kind of hangs together conceptually. Ah, but computers, they're made out of, um, and made by very smart people in big groups, subject to commercial pressures and using the best tools, intellectual tools they have available. So what we get is something more like <laughs> it's very ingenious and it just about works. And you can see in here, ideally I would point to all of the uh, plasma screens at the same time, but you just have to imagine that. You can see in this picture of garbage, down here there's like a, a pile of you know, hardware stuff and clear, clear moments one kind or another. And over here there's maybe a C compiler with its intermediate phases. <laughs> over here there's a, a final system and a P stack and a JavaScript script and a program. The piece belongs to the NSA about there. <laughs> and a browser. And on top is the stuff we used to talk about banks. <laughs> okay. So um, that's a bit of a problem. And then how do we build these pieces? Well, we build them like trial and error. And we don't, we're not even very good at identifying the error. So we write some code and maybe some ad hoc tests. And then we test some bits until things are marketable. And then we test some bits more until uh, we're tired. And then we keep on using them until they don't work anymore. So for this, write some ad hoc tests. And uh, marketing is how we explore whether the thing is doing what we want. And that is a basic problem because there are just ridiculously, insanely too many execution paths, right? The number of execution paths of some code typically scales uh, at least exponentially to the size of it. And I refer you back to that 100 million lines of code. And you can start you know, getting a large piece of paper and writing down a number. Right? So that's a problem. And then the last problem is that these things are discrete systems, not continuous systems. Right? So if you take a bridge, or a bridge design, and you overspec, you know, or underspec one of the bolts by 10%, or you hit something slightly too hard with a hammer, on the whole, the behavior of the system will deform continuously, at least within quite wide ranges. Right? Just occasionally, it will go spectacularly wrong and break. But usually, a, big, a small error in construction will lead to not much change in behavior. But here, as we saw in those bugs at the beginning, a tiny change in that 100 million lines can make something exploitable and uh, useless. So they're intrinsically harder than bridges. OK, so what can we do? We can give up and go back to pen and paper and books. Yes. It's the way forward, I tell you. Go out and tell all your mates. EMF 2016. Quill pen. <laughs> it's going to be a hard message to get across to everyone, though. So, what can we do? What can we do? Uh, we can do lots of different things. I'm going to enumerate some things. So, the first thing we can do is do better sort of normal software engineering with you know, more unit tests, and more assertions, and better coordination, and better management, and 15 more version control systems, none of which we can understand. So that's, that's all good and virtuous and it'll probably help a bit, but it's never going to get us to high levels of robustness or understanding, and it's not really my topic for today. So, option two. 
use languages based on ideas from 1975 or 1981 instead of 1965 or 1971. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of basically <laughs> useful ideas you know, developed in the late 70s and early 80s and what have you. Uh, having expressive type systems, having the compile time guarantees of type and memory safety. So you invade that whole combinatorial execution, combinatorial explosion of execution policy by checking some relatively simple but fantastically useful properties when you build the system not when you run it. So, and then there's a whole bunch of other useful programming language ideas, enforcement of boundaries of these interfaces, which is straightforward, it's easy peasy to design programming languages now, uh, which have all of these things built in and can be compiled to go quite fast. So there is, you know, for any individual, in working in some particular context, there might be a whole pile of legacy code that Stops you doing this. But for us collectively, there is no excuse for us not to be doing this all the time. And at a stroke, that would wipe out not all, but almost all of those security flaws. Just instantly. It's just stupid. Uh, point 2B. We should use programming languages that have been designed. <laughs> not what is up by a bunch of praise Lenny. So as a, as a um, programming language research person, this is an intention frustration and because the reasons why languages become popular have a strong inverse correlation with how good they are and whether people who invented them knew anything about designing programming languages. There are so many examples, <laughs> and also as this talk is being videoed on YouTube, I don't want too much hate mail, I'm not going to mention any of them. But all together now, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a bit feeble. Louder! Um, 
There is academic, so think of substantial academic projects, but on an industrial scale, tiny, have developed significant bits of fully formally verified, with machine checked proofs of correctness software. And so there's a bunch of compilers, so Concert, um, KML, so C like languages and ML languages, compiled all the way to assembly or binary, completely verified correct. People in UPenn have been verifying LLVM optimization classes. There's verified software fault isolation, which goes faster than the unverified version from uh, town and RSF and people in Harvard. There's the SEL4 verified hypervisor from guys in Australia. <coughs> so we can do this now um, for particular things where it's worth the effort. It's not that much effort, but it's quite high end effort. You have to have your like, PhD students, postdocs who can do this kind of thing. So in the long term, Ah, I'm not going to see any more of the slides. Clouds. In the long term, this is viable for significant software. But in the short term, it's tricky. It would be a hard thing for me to sell right now. So what's an intermediate but more tractable alternative is to not fully verify you know, whole components in this stack fully verify our production compilers or whatever, but at the very least, precisely specify the interfaces between all of these invisible pods in our software and hardware stack. And to test that those specifications are sound with respect to the uh, implementations, not just in their sort of global behavior, but intentionally, step by step, looking at all the internal states. Uh, and it's gone to turn off the big light, that's good. So, uh, so my colleagues and I have been doing this kind of thing for the last few years. We've looked at DCP and at uh, various functions processors and S86 and ARM and Powerland and uh, C and C++ concurrency standards, concurrency models and standards of Camel and the C language and people now looking at the TLS stack. Lots of kinds of things. So this is far too much stuff to talk about. I'm just going to talk about the multiprocessor part to just give you a little bit of a feeling for what kind of things involved in specifying one of these interfaces? So let's look at uh, multi processors. Multi processors, um, simple idea to make things go faster, many processors talking to the same memory. So this is not a new idea. There are no new ideas in computer science. All of them have been had before. And this one was first had in 1962. Can you see that? You don't, but you would see that. Two programs, very small ones, each with two threads and two actions, two memory reads or writes on those two threads, acting on two memory locations. And we'll talk about how they might behave. The first one, uh, there's a thread on this side, uh, which if you could see it, would say write x is 1 and then read y. And on this side, write y is 1. And read x. Right. And suppose everything is zero at the beginning. So naively, one might imagine you've got these two things running concurrently, and you've got two instructions on the left and two instructions on the right. So they might be into the, uh, this one might be entirely before that one, or that one might be entirely before this one, or they might be like that, or like that, or like that, or like that. Right? There's only six possible interleavings of two lists of length two. And in none of those will simultaneously that read read from before that write, and that read read from before that write. So you'll never get x is zero and y is zero being read out. Right? Are we all are we cool with that? You see, you want some, some other things to work. Hmm? You want some other things to work. You want to know exactly how to do this. We'll get to that. Very soon. <laughs> so, the first one ran that on a laptop. Um, uh, 
really one and one. Right? So 79 and million. And then quite often we'll get one of those other interleaving. And then quite often we'll read X is not, Y is not. Ah. Okay, so there's an inner. My hardware is fuzzy. And it may be that your hardware is fuzzy, and indeed we have found in most of the hardware that we've tested um, hardware bugs. So in software is not the only, only guilty party here. But in fact, this is perfectly intended by the designers. Right? The hardware designers want to make your computers go fast because you want that. Well, you want your computers to go fast. That's what you pay for. So they've added in devious optimizations, which this kind of program can see. So the model is not this simple thing with a bunch of processors talking to a shared memory. It's more complicated. Second example. Uh, so on this thread now, we'll write some data, and then we'll write some kind of flag. And on this thread, we'll read that flag until we see it set, and then we'll start reading the data. And the question is, are we guaranteed to see the good value of the data, or might we just see some old antiquated check? You try running that on a few kinds of shit. There's a whole bunch of other optimizations which make those go fast and also use less power, which is important in the R case. So do. So if you, as an innocent programmer, want to make these things happen in order, which for some Memory barrier instructions, of course. And you might wonder what they do. So you might go off and break them off to the vendor documentation and say, Dear Mr. Dear Mr. IBM, what does this instruction do? And you would see some text like this. <laughs> I'm going to start reading it out. But each clickable pair A, B, memory barrier controls that A will be performed with respect to any processor or mechanism to the extent required by the associated memory coherence required to reach before B is performed with respect to that processor or mechanism. A, capital A, includes all applicable storage accesses by any such processor or mechanism that have been performed with respect to B. Before the memory barrier is created, B includes all applicable storage access by any type and that are performed after a load instruction executed by that processor or mechanism has returned the value stored by store that is in B. Got that? So this is very deceptive, this stuff, because it looks like they've thought really hard about it and it means something precise that you just don't quite understand. <laughs> and we thought that for a long time, and we tried to make mathematical models of this. But in fact, when you get to it and you do lots of experiments and you go and talk to the architects, which we do, because we collaborate with a very smart and fine uh, IBM architect on this stuff, uh, you find that this does not describe what they actually do. Okay, and if you talk to uh, architects about that text, they say this kind of thing. All that horrible, horribly incomprehensible and confusing text that no one can parse or reason with, not even the people who wrote it. And this was one of the people who wrote it. So, a misery, a misery, I say. Um, so there's a basic problem here, which is that these, there's a fiction in the industry that we can write prose specifications and say to programmers, just read this book and write your program assuming only the facts in this book. And then, well, then what do they do? They go away and they read the book and they don't really understand it because it is not comprehensible, it does not have a meaning. Um, and then they write their code by that trial and error development process by testing against the particular implementations that they have on the particular execution paths that they happen to explore. Right? So this is rubbish. Right? You can't use these pro specifications to test programs. You can't use them to test that the hardware does what's intended. You can't use them, certainly not, to prove properties about anything. And as we see, you can't even use them to communicate between the organizations that are making the thing and the organizations that are using the thing. 
right, which is the basic thing a specification ought to be able to do. Right? So in this set, sense, none of these specifications really exist. It's all imaginary. It's a happy dream. So what can we do? Um, I was raised up as an experimental scientist. And empirical science will come at least slightly to our rescue here. Right. So we can, and indeed we have, invented some mathematically precise models of how we think these things behave. Not how they work inside, but just how they behave from the programmer's point of view. Right. And then you can make tools that don't just calculate one path, but for these small programs, explore all of the possible executions. Right? And they give you the set of everything that is allowed. And then you can run experiments on those same kind of small programs uh, to compare, and then compare that experimental data to check that it's all, all the experimentally allowed executions are actually allowed by your model. Right? And sometimes they're not. So if they're not, then either you found a bug in the processor and you think, ha, huh, we win, or you found a bug in your model and you get to fix up your model until it's true, and then you say, we win. Right? Uh, and then, in order to know whether these things are bugs or not, you have to talk to the architects. What's an architect? An architect who is someone who can, by definition, tell you whether observed processor behavior is a bug or not. Right? It's their intent that matters here. Yeah? And also, you need to talk to them to make sure the models match their intuition to get some assurance that you're not talking total nonsense. And then you can get some other validation. So you can prove, say, above these machine models, you can prove that you can compile C11 concurrency down to these machine models. And that gives you a bit more confidence that all of them are uh, sort of sensible. And then, because all of these things are iterative, you can go back to one and do it all again better, because you probably will have got some stuff wrong the first time. So, uh, is this rocket science? No, rocket science is, I think, at 1.45 on stage. I can't remember which. Um, it's not very hard, really. So all we've done is write down, well, we've you know, identified one of these abstraction layers that we really care about. And we've written down a description of not just some implementation, but all the behavior we think should be allowed at that abstraction layer. And then we've tested real systems against that. And in some sense, so we've written down those, uh, those definitions of, of sets of behavior in some random mathematical language. It doesn't really matter what. But you could do it in anything, anything which is clear and concise and has unambiguous meaning. You could, if you really had to, do it in C code. Right? So long as you understand that you're writing down a definition of all the allowed behavior, and that definition must be executable not as a system, but as a test oracle to decide if some observed behavior is allowed or not. Right? So that's a thing that people don't often do, but it's very easy. Yeah. It's not worth it all the time. You know, if you're building some app uh, for something, you may not even have any clue beforehand what it's supposed to do. Right? But any of these infrastructure things that we depend on and that are re-implemented in many contexts, it's clearly worth it. And when you've done that, then you're not limited, your testing process that we're still stuck with for the time being, you're not limited to the few ad hoc tests that you, you write. Because now you've got an oracle that can tell you whether any behavior is good or not. You can do random testing. You get amazingly better coverage and find millions of bugs. OK, I can't even read that slide. Ah, I said that. Um, so I said that. So it's time to stop, pretty much. So why, uh, there were some reasons why building robust systems are hard. And there are things we can do about it. And some of them are absolutely trivial. And then in the longer term, there is some hope for honest full verification. So I, I give you a sense of very cautious optimism. But I also exhort you uh, to think about this kind of stuff. Because if you just imagine the situation you know, 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, or if civilization endures a thousand years from now, if we don't fix this stuff up, if we don't fix this stuff, stuff up, we will have the x86 abstraction, the sockets API, the SSL API embedded through some ghastly stack of emulation layers in everything we use. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
for the rest of civilization. The end. Thank you for your attention. If, if you've got any, any questions, any questions? Time for questions? Oh, it's 15 minutes before the next talk. Ah. Oh. Um. Have you done any work or even uh, acquired experience of how this process might or is getting easier uh, as you've done it on try verifying dif different uh, interfaces? Oh, yeah. So we, we know how to do it much better than we did before. And there's, there are... So there are some questions in relating to how non-deterministic or how loose a specification you need that relate to how you can write that specification in a way that makes it actually usable. And there are other sort of sociological questions in how you talk to the designers or the C standards committee or whatever in order to get them to understand that this is a good idea. If you walk into a C standards committee meeting and you accidentally show them a piece of paper with you know, a little too much maths in, like an upside down A, then they, they go, you know, all, all queasy, because that's just not the language they work in. So you have to take care with that kind of stuff. Any more quick questions? Quick question over there. Um. Um, I, I totally agree on the design uh, of, of the language, mm -hmm. but I think most problem with most architects is not only construction architects want to build a cathedral, but every <laughs> architect wants to build a cathedral. And they have to be really stubborn to come across the bureaucracy so communication remains key um, yeah, yeah? I guess. okay yeah. Um, but how can you prevent that the architecture becomes too complex if the tools expand to make so so, 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 uh, so this is an interesting question so how do how can we arrange for there to be a pushback against adding complexity uh, so that's really tough but at least for programming language design and for some of these abstractions the mere fact of writing down a clean specification sort of forces you to notice the complexity. Right? Which otherwise, if you just have a textual language spec, it's very easy to just say, ah, we should, we'll, we'll add, we're going to add a new feature. We'll just chuck in a couple of paragraphs of text here. And that doesn't force you to understand how it interacts with everything else. Right? So that, I mean, this is not a total solution. I don't think there is a total solution, but that does give you a feedback mechanism that we don't have at the moment. One behind you. Behind you. Behind you. Um. Do you believe there's much of a market at the moment for formal verification, not of the language of it itself, but of programs written in a language? Uh, a market, I think, not much. I think there is potentially a significant market for um, for some very particular systems infrastructure to be verified. Right? So if I had a verified hypervisor with a small trusted computing base running on my phone, I would be a happier man when I come to EMF camp. And you know, ind industry wants that kind of thing, and there are some companies doing that. This SEL4 thing has some kind of commercialization route. Oh, oh no, there's another one there. Behind, behind, behind. Last one. Last one. So if um, PHP is the worst language of them all, which one would you say is the best? Um, <laughs> so I resolved when I was thinking of giving this talk to not answer any question of that general form. And in some sense, I don't know. I'm not in a position to know. I don't write a whole lot of code. Um, what I do when I, uh, I and my group do, we use OCaml and Haskell and sensible, you know, functional imperative languages. They're very good for this kind of semantic infrastructure kind of work. In other contexts, I'm not going to comment. Okay, enough. Thank you.